So uh, I have four goals today with this talk. And my first goal is to introduce you to something called polyforms. And let's see if this thing works. So polyforms are shapes that are, are made from, they're constructed by combining identical base shapes, like squares or triangles or cubes. And um, the most famous ones are tetrominoes. You've seen that before in Tetris, right? These are tetrominoes. These are all possible shapes that you can make with four squares joined together by the edges. But there are lots of other ones. <clears throat> um, this, th these are, are polyominoes. These are the examples of the five uh, polyominoes up to order five. There's the monomino here, one square, the, and it's named after the domino. See, that's where the name comes from. A domino is two squares, right? So that's a monomino. There's a domino. There's a triomino, a tetromino, and a pentomino. Right? And it goes up as high as you like. Uh, practically speaking, it goes up to about uh, heptominoes, seven, uh, but then you get holes in the middle of the shapes and it gets messy and it gets really, really big. Uh, it's really interesting at the pentominal stage. Um, <clears throat> and I brought some aids as well. Here's a, here's a set of pentominoes that my wife brought back to me from Japan, um, which is pretty cool. Pass it around. Try not to get it greasy. But. <laughs> So, um, so many uh, sets of, of polyforms can uh, combine to fill certain shapes. Uh, for example, uh, well, for example, there's uh, the in the pentominoes the five squares. There are twelve different pentominoes, and they combine to form a six by ten. Oh, here are the twelve pentominoes, and these are their common names. So you can spell Filipino and then T through Z with the pentominoes, and those are all 12 of them. So there are 12, each of them is five squares. They can combine to make a six by 10 rectangle. All right? These are all 12 of them, and they fit together perfectly. Now, <clears throat> what these are, these are called polyform puzzles or combinatoric dissection puzzles, different names for it. And, uh, wait a second. Oh, it printed out double-sided. I thought there were only four pages, uh oh. Okay. Um, so, uh, in, in the case of this puzzle, there are actually 2,339 different ways to solve it. Completely different ways to solve it. But, the trick is, try to find one. It's not so easy. Once you get the hang of it, it's not so bad, but uh, it's not that easy. Um, I first learned about pentominals from this book, Arthur C. Clarke's Imperial Earth. I read that when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And the main character has a set of those that he was given by his aunt or something, and it, it plays a part in the, in the book. And, uh, you know, a lot of people got into it because of this book. Um, and I picked up a, a set of pentominoes, like the one that's going around back when I was about 12 or 13, at Ted's Hobby Shop out in Point Claire. And I spent many, a, many an hour in my teenage years solving pentomino puzzles. So, yes, you know that I am a true geek. <laughs> Now, if you've ever played the game Blockus, you've played with polyominoes. These are all the polyominoes of order one through five are in Blockus. And there are lots of other, uh, other polyforms as well. These are um, hexiamonds. They're named after the diamond. So this purple is here is a diamond shape. Diamond is two triangles. So this is a hexiamond, which is six triangles. And I think there are 12 of these shapes. So this is one, per, one, uh, one puzzle. Um, and if you've ever played Blockus Trigon, you've played with polyimons, all polyimons of order one through six. And um, yeah, there and these these games are a lot of fun. You should try them. Um, there's polyhexes um, made of hexagons, like a honeycomb. This is pentahex, so they're uh, five hexagons, and these are all 22 possible shapes. In this case, it makes a 10 by 11 hexagon lozenge kind of shape. And um, you can also get into three dimensions, like solid pentominoes. Solid pentominoes are, are the regular flat pentomino, but they're one unit thick. Right? And they make a three by four by five solid. And I think there are over 3,000 different solutions for this. But I have yet to find one on my own. And I've got a set of, of pentominoes here, uh, solid pentominoes. This one I bought at the Valet de Coeur over on... Uh, 
over on Saint Denis. So pass that around. You can see that they're one unit thick as well, so they they go in sideways as, by as well. You Sorry. What do you mean by solution? A solution meaning take those twelve shapes and put them together into this solid. Okay. You can do it over three thousand different ways. So these ones can go into that shape. Yes, they can. Okay. But try to find just one. <laughs> <laughs> this one, trying to do this, I get very frustrated, so I don't spend very long. The regular flat ones, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. But it's, it's fun. It's, it's a, a, a mental challenge, a mental thing. Um, you've got uh, a puzzle called Soma Cubes, which was invented by a gentleman named Piet Hein. I think he was a Danish... Uh, architect, something like that. He also invented the super ellipse, if you've ever heard of that. No? Well, it's pretty cool. These are, these are all of the non, <clears throat> all of the non-convex shapes you can make with cubes up to three dimensions. Means that if you try to, it, it's all, it's up to four cubes. And if you try to go to five, then suddenly you can get into the fourth dimension and he didn't want to go there, so. <laughs> Sorry? What do you mean by that? Non-convex. Well, convex means convex means that if you go around, it's always um, you never have a, an inside. Um, okay. Uh, you you all a convex one will always have outside corners, but non-convex has inside corners. Okay. So a convex shape would be like just two together is convex. So two doesn't exist in soma cubes. It's only three or four. You can put these together into a three by three by three cube. 240 different ways. And it's pretty easy to find one. All right. You've got, uh, this is pentacubes. This is if you take the pentominoes, but you extend it into three dimensions. They're not flat anymore. And you've got 29 different ones of these. You can make some very interesting shapes. <clears throat> so, uh, and then there's another puzzle, which I've um, never even touched. These are called polysticks. And what these are, instead of putting squares together, you take line segments on a grid. So the, 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 the little segments on your graph paper. And these are all the possible shapes from one up to four poly sticks. And they fit together into this lattice. And I just look at that and I say, wow, that's really cool that they all fit together like that. Maybe that's just me. I hope you find it interesting. <laughs> I hope you find it interesting too. So This one I don't know. I don't know. Uh, at least I don't know offhand. I don't know if, I, if, if anybody actually knows this one. Um, some of the puzzles I've done, I've devised for this software, don't, um, haven't been explored fully, and I haven't let the computer run long enough to actually find all of them. Some of these puzzles can take days, uh, weeks, to find, especially because it's written in Python, which is not known for its speed. <clears throat> it's known for its speed of... of writing the code. That's what I'm interested in. My time is more valuable than the computer's time. So my second goal is to introduce you to some interesting algorithms and some techniques. First I'm going to tell you about the, the first time I, I implemented this. Um, it was back in Sejep or University. I didn't want to study so I started writing this software and I was using Object Pascal, an object-oriented variant of Pascal. So I was using, uh, the algorithm was using brute force um, and um, uh, with some heuristics. Uh, the heuristics being things like, well, the program would, the brute force would be, the program would place every piece everywhere it possibly could. And the heuristics would be that, okay, the program would look at the remaining space and make sure that it's a multiple of five. Okay, so it wouldn't break up a space and three on one side and two on the other. Well, that doesn't work. Um, if it found a space that was exactly five squares, it would try to figure out which piece fits in that space. And if that piece was available, it would put it there. And if it wasn't, it would backtrack. Um, it would check for bottlenecks, like a, a thin area where, uh, because of the thinness, even though it wasn't exactly five squares, it, still only one shape could possibly fit. And um, so basically, I made the computer solve the puzzle the way I was solving the puzzle. And that should uh, ring warning bells. <laughs> uh, it didn't with me, but I was very naive. And it never worked. And I gave up. <clears throat> so 
When I first learned Python in um, 1998, this was my um, this was my project to learn the language. It never well, it had bugs. Uh, I never got a, and I, you know what? I think I might no, no, I shouldn't say that. I never got a solution out of it. Okay, it was a it was a good learning experience when I wrote, wrote it in Pascal, Object Pascal, but I never got an actual solution out of the thing. So that's my definition of not work. I can't remember at this point whether I whether it ever you know compiled. I'm sure it compiled properly, but I can't remember if I got all the bugs out of it or if it was just a time thing. Back in those days, that would have been. That would have been, let's say, Sejep. I was in Sejep from 85 to 87. Computers were really slow back then. Even if you were writing in Pascal, um, it was slower than writing in Python today. So, um, so back to Python. So I used it as a, as a test bed to, to learn how to, uh, how to use this interesting language. And I, I uh, fixed it up. I got it to work. But it was still, it was very, very slow. And so I sort of, I gave up. I even went so far as to register a project on SourceForge, and it's a, it's a four-digit project, which tells you something. I was in the very early days of SourceForge, before they had 10,000 projects. And, but it, it remained dormant for many years until 2006. Um, so then I came across a very interesting paper by Donald Knuth. Um, who does not know who Donald Knuth is? Huh? Okay. Learn. <laughs> Learn. <clears throat> He's a professor or professor emeritus at Stanford, and he wrote The Art of Computer Programming. He's still writing it. It's this series of books all about algorithms. He's the father of the analysis of algorithms. He wrote the Tech Computer Typesetting Program, T-E-X. It's actually, it's, it's Greek letter. It's, it's a chai. It's not an X. Uh, sorry? Tau Epsilon Key. Okay. A lot of people call it text, but it's actually tech. Uh, and he also wrote the, one of the first literate programming systems called Web. Um, so he wrote this um, paper called Dancing Links. It was published in 2000. I read it in 2006. And he discusses this algorithm called Algorithm X. And uh, that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, and this algorithm finds all the solutions to the exact cover problem. So there's a lot of big words, right? a lot of big concepts. I'll explain them. So here's the exact cover problem. So what have I got here? So this is the statement. Given a matrix of zeros and ones, does the matrix contain a set of rows which together contain exactly one one in each column? All right? So it's a sparse matrix of zeros and ones. You want to find a set of the rows which when squished together have ones all across, but no twos, no zeros, right? Um, and to find every solution, we must find all such sets of rows. So the trick is to construct a matrix that corresponds to the puzzle. So <clears throat> the first thing you need to do is you name the columns. And you name the columns after uh, the names of the pieces. And I showed you the pentominoes all have names. Uh, and other puzzles do too. Some of the, with some of them, I just made up names. Um, and then also the coordinates of your puzzle, your space that you're trying to fill. So this is what a header could look like for a, for a hypothetical puzzle. It has three pieces, A, B, and C, and it fits into a three by three um, array. So these are the, the oh, I can try laser. I got, oh, it's not working. Um, you've got, uh, Oh, laser light, there you go. So here are the, the puzzle piece names and then the coordinates here. Um, and then you need a row for every possible position of every piece. So you've got a piece, and it can go here, 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 like that, everywhere in the puzzle that it can go. And it can also go here, 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 and then here, 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 like that. And so every possible position you make a row, and the rows would look like this. Um, there would be the you put a one under the name of the piece that you're representing, and a one under each coordinate that the piece exists in. So this is in 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. Right? And then um, you'd have a... Um, uh, then you'd try to find solutions where you'd find 
a set of rows such that you add them all together and you get ones all across. And one such solution might look like this. So you see there's, there's one piece A, one piece B, one piece C, and every coordinate has one one in it. So there's a solution to this hypothetical puzzle. All right? So I'll give you a trivial example here. Um, so here's a puzzle of two pieces, A and B, into a space that's three squares big. Trivial, right? Very trivial. And here's the, the puzzle matrix that results from that. There are three possible positions for A, here, here, and here, and two possible positions for B, here and here, if you allow rotation, which in this case we do. And so if you look at this matrix, you can see, well, okay, you need one of A, so let's choose this one. This one, um, it doesn't work. If you put A here, you take this one, there's no, row, there's no B row that matches. But if you put A, say, up here on 0, 1, which is here, then you try to find, so that's this one taken, you try to find a B where it's the other two. Oh, there it is, it's the bottom row. So this row here and this row here combine to make a solution. So that's the kind of thing we're, we're dealing with. Was there a question? No? Okay. Um, so uh, the problem is that matrices for these kinds of puzzles can get really, really big. For the 6 by 10 pentominoes puzzle, the matrix is 72 columns wide, there are 12 pieces and 60 coordinates, and it is 2,032 rows long, which is pretty big. And even that, that's not so big. If you take a pentacubes puzzle, which has 29 pieces, it is, uh, there's uh, 29 pieces, there's 145 coordinates to fill, so there's 174 columns and six, over 6,000 rows. So it gets pretty big, pretty quickly. It's like, you know, square of, of the number or the cube of the number or something like that. I haven't, I haven't figured it out. So, <clears throat> uh, so that's the exact cover problem. And then... Knuth outlined this algorithm he called algorithm X. And this is how you solve the problem. How are we on time here? Probably want to speed it up. All right. I won't bother going through all of this. Just believe me, it works. Okay? <laughs> if you're interested in, in the details, uh, read the paper. Um, and then the other part of the paper is this concept called dancing links. So in order to... to well, I'll go back one stage. <clears throat> One of the things you do in this, in this uh, algorithm is you cover um, columns. Cover means to remove a column from the matrix and remove all the rows that have a one in that column that you just removed. So you end up removing a column and a bunch of rows as one operation. Uh, and you do that here and then you do that here again. So you end up messing with this matrix a lot. So even though, okay, 175 by 6,000 doesn't seem that big when you've got gigabytes, when you have to do a backtracking recursive algorithm and you have to you know, slice and dice this matrix all the time, then it gets, you don't want to be copying this matrix a lot because it's pretty big. So you need an efficient uh, data structure. <clears throat> so uh, Newth's algorithm uses doubly linked lists, like this. So every node has uh, a left link and a right link. His al algorithm actually uses quadruply linked uh, lists. They actually al also have an uplink and a downlink. We'll just deal with doubly linked lists for now. Um, <clears throat> so, say you've got a linked list like this and you want to remove node B. You know what node B is. You want to remove it from the list. It's easy. To remove it, you just say, okay, <clears throat> say b.left.right equals b.right. What does that mean? B dot left is A, make its dot right the same as B's dot right. So A now points to C, do the same with C, C now points to A. So this is what you get, right? Now B is out of the list. But <clears throat> this is a backtracking algorithm. You've got to put them back again. So how are you going to keep track of all this stuff? Well, the, the really cool thing about this uh, paper, the, which was actually... Uh, Knuth popularized it, but somebody else came up with it, was that there's something to remember. B remembers who its neighbors are. B knows. B still points to A and C. Right? A and C don't point to B anymore, but B still points to A and C. Right? So, you can to, to reinsert B into the list, 
you say b dot left right dot right equals b, and b dot right dot left equals b. And suddenly, it's back the way it was, back to the original state. So this is called dancing links, because the links dance around. They turn off and on, and they dance. They, so he called it dancing links. Um, and yeah, it's very, very useful for uh, recursive backtracking. So, <clears throat> so then we have this algorithm he calls DLX, which is Dancing Links Algorithm X. Um, and uh, it uses quadruple linked lists, which have left, right, up, and down, as I said. Um, and it represents a two-dimensional sparse matrix. So you don't need nodes for all the zeros. You only need the nodes for the ones. And actually, if you only are representing the ones, you don't even need ones. You just need nodes. right? <clears throat> so it, it's an efficient use of, of space. Um, and this algorithm, when I read this, it was so different from what I had done myself and so obviously superior um, that uh, it, you know, it sort of blew my mind. And uh, what it does is it adapts the puzzles to the computer's way of thinking, not to my way of thinking. Computers think differently than people, well, you know, and computers don't actually think, right? They're dumb, stupid machines. We have to tell them what to do. Well, I couldn't teach it to think the way I do, so this, this way it can do its work the way it does it. Um, and it's a very efficient and flexible system. Um, let's see. Answer the phone! <laughs> let's see. Uh, and it's also applicable, it's flexible, it's a, applicable to other, other puzzle-like problems, like um, the eight queens problem, you're familiar with that? You've got eight queens on a, chess, on a chessboard, and you don't want any of them to be able to take any of the other ones. Uh, and it also can be used for Sudoku by just very carefully arranging the columns. And then after that, you just let it run. Is it like anything with grid space? Like any, any, kind of, of, any kind of packing problem, you know, that kind of thing, uh, it'll work on. So Sudoku works, works quite well as well. And I've already written the, the module to do the, you know, the solving. So all you have to do is make the matrix and feed it to it, and it'll do the work. Hmm? So, uh, so after I read Knuth's paper, my, my old itch resurfaced, and, I, and uh, Polyform Puzzler is the result. And that's what I, my third goal is to talk to you about Polyform Puzzler. So it's a, what is it? It's a set of tiny little front-end applications, which are two or three lines long. And they call a bunch uh, a Python package. Uh, it's uh, um, some libraries. There's the exact cover algorithm, coordinate systems, the polyforms themselves, and the puzzles. So they describe all this stuff. And it's easy to um, it's uh, easy to add new puzzles and and even new polyforms. And it's not incredibly difficult to even add new coordinate systems to it. That makes it easy. Okay. Um, where am I here? I'll use a puzzle to keep my place. So we've got over 100 puzzles in the, in the project made of 12 polyforms. I showed you a few already, and I'll show you some more. Um, but it's not an interactive program yet. If somebody wants to write a GUI for it, that would be really cool. Uh, what it does have, though, is it has SVG, scalable, scalable vector graphics, and X3D rendering of all the solutions. The pictures you've seen so far, almost all of them have been drawn by my software. And it's not that difficult. Um, SVG is just a XML, so you just have templates and you know, slice and dice and it works. Um, the project has uh, uh, a bunch of, of uh, it has a gallery of puzzles and solutions. So, conclusion. So, was, uh, was anybody counting? So my fourth and final goal was to show you some pretty pictures along the way. I've shown you some, here a couple more. So here's Heptiamond's snowflake. Here's another snowflake. This is, this is one my, my wife got me. Um, and I don't know about you, but I look at this and I just think that's so beautiful. It's like snowflakes in real life. It's amazing that nature works the way it does, even mathematically, that this could be possible. It just blows my mind. Um, and then uh, we've got this one here. This is Pentacube's corner crystal. So you've got three walls here, floor and two walls. Then you've got 
crystal staircase in the corner. And this is interesting. Uh, a gentleman in New Zealand had, been, um, had devised this puzzle something like 20 years ago, and he's been working on it for 20 years. Sorry? Given a single coordinate system, uh, yeah. is a number to actually build the matrix that goes into the exact number algorithm the same? Uh, yes. For all the puzzles? Yep. As long as you make the coordinate system uh, fit, as long as you make a coordinate system make the matrix. So we have like two algorithms now for, for 2G and 3G? Uh, it's, no, just one algorithm. But, Creating the matrix is kind of the hard part. That's the part where you have to really think hard. And like when you go back to this one. I've seen that you could show us that algorithm, actually. Oh, well, that, uh, that algorithm. If that one is per, per puzzle. It is, it's per puzzle. Or it's per, it's per polyform type. So there's one for polyominoes, which are just, it's a grid, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Then when you get to polyimons, which are triangles, then it gets tricky. And I actually use a sort of a pseudo 3D coordinate system for this. Um, if, a, if a triangle is pointing up, it's a zero, and if it's pointing down, it's a one. But other than that, it's just a, it's a skewed grid. It's like a grid like this, and, and skewed. And I also use a 2D um, um, coordinate system for polyhexes, you know, the, the uh, honeycomb shapes. Um, the poly sticks, which are the, which are the, the line segments, that's also a pseudo 3D where I use zero for horizontal and one for vertical. And then it's just X, Y after that. But what you have to do is translate from some format that makes sense to, to you as a human to a format that makes sense to the computer. And the computer in this case doesn't know anything about the underlying puzzle. You, what the, the software does is it takes the, the puzzle description, turns it into ones and zeros, matrix, the exact cover algorithm turns away and delivers the, the solutions. And then uh, the software has to translate it back into something that we can understand. Um, usually the, the output is ASCII text and then graphics like this. Martin. I have a few questions. Um, so just about what you're saying just now, because it's tough. Sure. Um, so one part is creating the mapping from the, the target shape you want into the matrix. But the second part is also generating each of the possible variants of the pieces of rotation. That's right. Translation should be trivial. The rotation that depends on the domain. Could be yeah, um, it's interesting. Do you do that with the computer, yeah. or do you actually manually? No. <laughs> when I first implemented it, I did it manually, but now I've got the computer doing all that stuff, and it it. It makes me wish that I'd paid more attention back in linear algebra. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> because all of that stuff comes into play, you know, matrix matrices and multipl multiplying matrices and groups and all that stuff. It, it, uh, it's all useful here. Um, and I wish I, I... I'm sure I've done stuff in the software that has names, yeah. you know, that that it, you know, it's, it's a recognized transformation in, in mathematics, but I don't know what, the, what it's called, because I forgot, because it was 20 years ago that I learned it. I wish there was a Google that you could say, my problem is like this and like that, and like yeah. that. It's funny me the yeah. similar problem. Well, it's probably all on math world or something, but you know. So my second question is more fundamental. I mean, again, is that part, I'm sure you, you must have mentioned it, but... Not um, necessarily. So you, you're given a domain, you're given a, uh, a shape to mm -hmm. fill in, um, and it seems clear to me that you you don't have an infinite number of pieces to choose from. No. Because then you, it, would be, it would be a trivial problem of cutting out the domain. Yeah. With whatever well, it's not a trivial problem, but it's, it's easier. Like you have an inventory of shapes. Yes. Um, now, given an inventory, a specific inventory of shapes, it's possible that there is no solution. Yes, it is. Without the domain. Yes, it is. Now, so what's, what's the input to your program? How do you... Do you actually start from the domain, generate the pieces, and tell someone, here's a puzzle? Or, I mean, what does it do exactly? You start from, from a puzzle somebody created, and then um, solve I've, it? Yep, yeah, uh, start from a puzzle somebody created, or I created myself. You know, in idle moments at work, I'll, I'll doodle on graph paper. You'll and, 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 sorry? You'll cut out the pieces, like I said. Yeah, well, you know, I've never, I've never actually done this physically, even though I've got a set of these pieces. I've never actually done this particular puzzle physically. It's only in the computer that, that's actually done it. I mean, here are the pieces. So you have to generate the inventory of pieces. 
that yes. itself is a problem. Oh, okay, yes. The inventory of pieces, all the combinations of, in this case, seven equilateral triangles, um, that I have done manually. And actually enumerating, poly, uh, enumerating polyforms is a hard problem in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, um, but then there's different kinds of inventories. You can yeah. say you can't have more than two pieces that are the same yes. basic shape. Yeah, and when you get into that, you get into some tricky areas. And I've done a couple of puzzles like that. And, you have, and it's one of those cases where I have to sort of sit down and th think hard. How am I going to represent this as a matrix? And I'll be happy to talk about it after, but I don't think it, we can so just one get into last that. Thing. So sure. when, when you start with an inventory of pieces, let's say I give you a puzzle and I say you fit this in a snowflake, does the algorithm fail gracefully? Does it say, okay, there's no solution? Yes. Yeah. It turns away for, depending on how big the puzzle is, for anywhere from milliseconds to weeks, and then spits out a, a says zero solutions found. It didn't find a row that had no links? No. No. I haven't found any bugs recently. Francois? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Who snowflake? This snowflake? This picture? My software did that. So you designed it to that form? Yes. Oh, well, well, I designed the shape. Okay. Um, there's a website where you can make graph paper. I don't know if you've ever seen this. You can make graph paper in a regular grid or, tri or, or triangular or hexagonal um, and other ways as well. And I printed out a bunch of triangular graph paper and I started doodling, making little pictures. Just like you feel. Yeah, just for fun. Just for fun. Just for fun. So you just made a uh, kind of a guess that these, uh, this, this inventory would fit into this shape? Uh, basically, what, what I do is I start with a hexagon, say a hexagon like this, and realize that, okay, this set of shapes doesn't fit in that hexagon. I, I like to start with the simplest basic shapes first, you know, squares, triangles, hexagons. And then if it doesn't fit, I'll play with it, make holes, uh, add appendages. I, I like symmetry. Um, so I would just play with it and, you know, pull it out and, until I could find one that fit or sometimes I couldn't find one that fit, stuff like that. So in this case, I'm not sure, I can't remember if I made this one up or if I found it on a website, because there's lots of websites about these poly, uh, polyforms out there. There are some websites that are just incredible, the scope of these things, you know, the amount of work that's... Another fascinating question on a different level is find all the symmetrical shapes that these, uh, this end of work can fit into. That would be a hard problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah an NP hard or whatever you call it. Was there another question from over here? How long did this one take? This particular one, uh, uh, I can tell you. Let's see, Puzzler Solutions, uh, Heptimons, uh, Snowflake Two. Text. Let's see how many how many have I got here? Oh, I didn't I didn't solve them all. I've only got I've only got a couple of. Oh, I only got one. Only got one so far. So this is, this is part of what the program gives me. I did some ASCII art um, to print it out. And, and I think that's the same. Is that the same one? Yeah, it's the same solution. Yeah. And my software will also, it'll generate the ASCII art, and then you can feed it the ASCII art, and it'll generate a, a graphic. It doesn't actually parse the ASCII art, although I've done that in the past. Um, it, it, it parses this data here. So here at the end, you've got the, uh, the names of the pieces and then the coordinates they fill. And it'll read all that block in and turn it into a piece of uh, SVG graphics. Can you parallelize the uh, solving algorithm? Yes, yes. It can be parale parallelized, yes. Can you need to duplicate data because then you're dancing things? No. Well, yes, you'd have to duplicate the matrix. You'd have to duplicate the matrix uh, across each each process would have to have its own copy. But um, basically at the beginning of the algorithm you choose a starting point um, deterministically. You, you say, well, uh, to, to keep the, um, to keep, let's see, what you try to do is you, keep, you, you try to keep the search tree narrow and deep as opposed to broad and bushy, right? Um, and so you choose, uh, the, uh, you choose the column in the matrix which has the fewest ones in it. 
that'll give you the fewest, that'll give you the, the narrowest um, search tree after that. And uh, so you choose the first one, and then deterministic, or, sorry, non-deterministically, in other words, one at a time, you go through all of the the, uh, the rows in that column. Exhaustively. Sorry? Exhaustively. You, you just do a for loop over them. And so you can just, you could feed each iteration to a different process, a different computer, whatever. Uh, and if you had lots more computers, you could go at another level down and another level down. I haven't done it, but, you know, you could. How long did it take? How, how long did, which take? This computation. This computation, you know what? It doesn't say. Usually I have it. Um, let's see, I'll try to find one here. Uh, um, let's see, pentacubes, uh, corner crystal. So this is the one I showed you a moment ago. You can't even see it here. Darn. Yeah, I think it was solved in long time. Um, some of them are, I mean, if you take some like pentominoes, the 6 by 10 pentominoes, that took, uh, you can see here, 2,339 solutions. It took uh, 19 minutes in this case. Um, some of them take minutes, some of them take microseconds, some of them take weeks. Um, I've actually run it on my computer at work, left it on overnight, um, nice down the, the the process so it didn't bother me when I was there during the day and left it running for weeks. Um, and also the, the software saves state. So you can cancel it, you can control C out of it, and then resume it and pick it up later and it'll and pick up from where it was. A, a C document list structure. You're using Python. I am using Python, so that's, that's a good point. So I'm Python glad you brought that up. It doesn't have lists. Well, no, it, well, it sure. You just have references to objects. Yeah, no, but they're not real lists, they're just. What, what's a real list? Well, no, I'm actually not using. I'm not using. I'm not using Python lists. I'm using there. Each one is an object with attributes left and right, which point to other objects. So, um, if anybody is interested in writing a C extension module, um, uh, I've got a great project for you. Uh, the hard work is all done already, but I'm, my C is very rusty, and I have no desire to uh, polish it up. Pyrex? Um, okay. Well, uh, I don't. I haven't actually learned Pyrex, so. Okay. Uh, I, what I have done with it is I've used uh, Psycho, and that sped it up like three times. Um, but uh, yeah, I could do that. I just never got around to it. To me, it doesn't really matter um, how fast it runs. I'm just interested in in reaching the solutions, in finding the solutions. When there's two thousand solutions, I, it's cool to see them all. When I reach 10,000 solutions, I don't care anymore, you know? And if I get just one solution after a week, that's enough for me. You know, hey, there is a solution. That's cool. That's... When you say save state, do you just pickle it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I use pickle. <laughs> that's right. It's just pickled objects. That's all it is. And um, there's that one there. And there's this one. And I can show you something if you've... Do we have time? we run out of time. Okay. Um, this is, let's see, woo. let's see if I can zoom it out here. And this is a program called FreeWRL. And so this, my software also generates X3D uh, data. And so you can play with it in 3D. So you can see the, behind it and see what the actual pieces are if you want to build it. <laughs> So I was, I was saying about this, this puzzle here. This was an interesting one. This gentleman in New Zealand devised this puzzle like 20 years ago, and he's been trying to solve it ever since. For 20 years, he's been trying to solve this puzzle. He got as close as all but one piece fitting. Can you imagine? Like, getting all the way, he gets all excited, and oh, damn, it doesn't fit. And the problem is with this puzzle is that the, they're 3D. You know, the pieces go flat and then uh, this way. And so all of the 3D pieces have to be on the, on the edges, on the corners, or here in the middle. They can't, you know, the flat ones have to be here. And so he found my, my project, and uh, he wrote to me. And he asked me if, if, um, if uh, a polyform puzzler could solve this puzzle. I said, yeah, I think so. And eh, I was busy that week, so I wrote it up a week later. And 
it took a few days, I think, for it to uh, come up with a solution, but it found a solution. He was very happy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think there are a lot of solutions, but I don't know how many. Um, yeah, and in the future, I hope to explore some as yet unexplored polyforms that I've thought up in my head, some 3D ones that don't seem to be explored very well, um, and maybe even work on a GUI. Uh, but uh, uh, if you'd like to help, if you find this kind of thing interesting, and why wouldn't you, <laughs> um, then I'd be happy to have your help. You should build a really wicked one and send it to a guy in New Zealand in pieces. <laughs> in pieces. <laughs> what do you... Oh, he he also came up with the uh, he also came up with another one which I um, the the one back around slide six or so uh, he came up with this one also um, this fortress kind of looks like a, a video game um, and uh, I was able to help him solve that one too so it was pretty cool. Yeah. So and in your experience, like. Like this guy, this, he spent 20 years trying to find a solution, so he yeah. had the intuition that there was a solution, right? Then yeah. How, how would you know that? Like, yeah, but you can devise it. I mean, like, how, how would you, like, yeah, you generally have an intuition on whether or not there is a solution? Um, well, you can, you can. Um, there was a, a solution, there was a puzzle I came up with, sort of similar to this. Um, you take three planes, the... Uh, the XY plane, the YZ plane, and the XZ plane, you know, three intersecting planes, and you make sort of an octahedron out of them. It's like you take this one and duplicate it there, and duplicate it there, and duplicate it there, and smaller. And I tried to come up with, I tried that, uh, but it wasn't working well, and so I thought, okay, I'll think about this. And what, one thing you can do is you can use, you can use parity to see if you can solve a, a puzzle. So, <clears throat> Um, for example, if you color each of these cubes like a checkerboard, so black, 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 and then white, 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 you know, black, white, black, white, like that, and if you, uh, you can determine if there is an overabundance of one color over the other, right? And there often is, especially a puzzle like this. This puzzle probably has an overabundance of about 10 of one color over the other. And then you look at your pieces, each individual piece, and you color each piece, and you see, is there an over, overabundance on each piece? And then you add up all the overabundances of the pieces, and if they do not at least match the overabundance of the puzzle, it's not solvable at all. Uh, there are some, some kind of simple rules of thumb. Yeah, there are. There are. There are some simple rules of thumbs, and there are some, some very complex rules of thumb that people have come up with that are smarter than me. Um, but that's one of them. So, uh, so that, that puzzle, which was the, the crossed planes, I figured out that that, pro I think the overabundance in the puzzle was about 25 and in the pieces was like 27. So it was not very likely that there would ever be a, uh, um, a solution. So it's left on the, in the project, it's left unsolved. I haven't had time to run the computer long enough, and that puzzle would, one of these puzzles to, to run into completion under Python, not Pyrex, sorry, uh, not yet anyway, um, one of these puzzles would probably take weeks, months to, to run. I mean, the, the solution space is so huge uh, that it would just take a long time. Should write one of those screen savers. Like, uh, yeah, it'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 and yeah, farm it out among the world. Yeah, it could be done. Um, the the um, solution, the solver, the exact uh, cover algorithm. I wrote it as a generator, so uh, uh, it could be done that way. And and as I I wrote it as a generator so that I could basically monitor it as it go, went along, and so that I, and it's a reentrant generator so that I can. And you can you can cancel the process and then go back into it, stuff like that. Yeah. Can you spend some time optimizing your own Python? Optimizing my own Python, um, a little bit, but not too much. I'm not really an optimizer. No, I don't really care about speed too much. That's yeah. true. I just wanted to check. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at Docutils. It's dirt slow. I don't care. <laughs> it, uh, one of our, our uh, participants 
sped it up by about 30% through some simple profiling. And, and you know, he likes doing that. I'm not interested, really. David, were there any parts of Python that were particularly useful for being able to solve the problem? Um, parts of Python, well, the generator, generators were useful. Because it meant that I could isolate you know, one part of the algorithm from the rest of, of, of it. Um, uh, just Python's dynamicity itself, you know, the, the fact that it has, that any, you, you can have an attribute just point to anything. And I just, Python fits my brain because I don't care about all the bookkeeping and all the, all the little details. So that certainly helped. I mean, the algorithm in, in code, I can show you um, exact cover. Here's, let's see, here's this, the solving this this method here at the top, from here to here, that is the expression of the algorithm I showed you in pseudocode, and it's only about half again as long as the pseudocode. Now, of course, there are you know dot uncover and dot cover and stuff like that, which are methods elsewhere. But if you can take a, an algorithm and fit it onto one screen, even if it's at eight, eighteen point type, then hey, you're doing pretty well. I thought this pseudocode. Yeah, exactly. It's executable pseudocode, yeah. as opposed to executable line noise. Uh, oh, that's, that looks like an artifact of maybe, yeah, the vertical line. Oh, that that was an artifact of. Uh, I think that was anti-aliasing. <laughs> yeah, that's just an anti-aliasing artifact. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. Yeah. You know, there's probably a mode. You know Emacs, you know. Come on. There's a mode. Oh, there, uh, Emacs has everything. Everything. I mean, back when I used to use it on, on Unix workstations, the icon was a kitchen sink. <laughs> has everything, including the kitchen sink. So that's uh, the end of my talk. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yeah. nobody's asleep. I hope you found that interesting. <laughs> Good.